Welcome back. South Korea and the United States have conducted a joint air drill today in response to North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile launch. A joint drill comes after South Korea military warned against North Korea's ballistic launch, calling it a clear violation of the UN Security Council resolution and also stressing the need for the action to be stopped immediately. Here's more in this report. South Korean military says North Korea fired an intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM, today. The launch, reported by both South Korean and Japanese officials, comes a day after a smaller missile launch by the North and its warning of fiercer military responses to the U.S. boosting its regional security presence. However, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida condemns North Korea for firing the missile that landed within his country's exclusive economic zone in what the Coast Guard said was roughly 210 kilometer from an island in northern Hokkaido. We naturally lodged a strong protest against South Korea, which has repeated its provocations with unprecedented frequency. I would like to reiterate that we absolutely cannot tolerate this. So far, no report of damage to planes or ships have been confirmed. Meanwhile, Prime Minister of Spain Pedro Sanchez met with South Korean President Yoon suk yeol in Seoul to boost bilateral ties. Both Sanchez and Yoon also condemned North Korea for the missile launch. Similarly, the United States and its allies, including South Korea, Australia and Canada, condemned North Korea's action. We strongly condemn these actions and we again call for North Korea to stop further unlawful destabilizing acts. On behalf of the United States, I reaffirm our ironclad commitment to our Indo-Pacific alliances. Together, the countries represented here will continue to urge North Korea to commit to serious and sustained diplomacy. We once again urge the DPRK to immediately cease all types of provocation and abide by relevant UN Security Council resolution. Uh, we stand with the world and indeed uh, with our, our allies uh, in opposing and condemning this action in the strongest possible terms and calling for North Korea uh, to stop this reckless activity, this provocation, and to stand by and to, to comply with previous United Nations resolutions, and we stand ready uh, to be a part of uh, a global response to this. Thank you. Uh, Canada joins our allies in condemning in the strongest terms the continued irresponsible uh, actions of North Korea uh, with multiple missile launches, including uh, the uh, latest ones. These are, as our friends have said, clear violations of UN uh, resolutions uh, and need to be condemned by all uh, in the region and around the world. In the meantime, China says it is closely monitoring developments on the Korean Peninsula after the North's provocations earlier in the day. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning says maintaining peace and stability on the peninsula is in the interest of the international community. From one missile launch to another, this time in India, the country has successfully launched its first privately developed rocket, the Vikram S, today, a milestone of the country's effort to create a commercial space industry and to compete on cost. The 545-kilogram rocket developed by space startup Skyroo took off from the Indian Space Agency's launch site near Chennai. Video footage shows the rocket taking off from the space center, leaving a plume of smoke and fire in its trail. According to officials, the rocket splashed down in the Bay of Bengal about five minutes after launch. The Indian government has been pushing to develop a private space industry to complement its state-run space program known for its affordable launches and missions. We are very excited to announce that we scripted history today by successfully launching India's first privately developed rocket, Vikram Yes. The vehicle reached space to an altitude of 89.5 kilometers and completed the required mission objectives. This Praram mission 
as the name signifies, is the beginning of a new era in the Indian space ecosystem. It's also a, a major step forward to India developing its own space ecosystem and emerging as a frontline nation in the community of world nations. And of course, a turning point in India's startup movement. As COP27 wraps up in Sham El Sheikh, Egypt, it's time to look back at what has been achieved or not in the global effort to fight climate change, especially with the ongoing energy crisis and the fallout from the war in Ukraine. For more, let's turn to our correspondent, Sir Chiponda Chimbelu in, the, in Berlin. Uh, he joins us now. Uh, Chiponda, how have Europe's efforts at COP27 been received? Well, um the climate conference has not been very well received by activists. We've heard from Greta Thunberg calling it a greenwashing event. And what we've seen from the EU in terms of a billion euro fund uh, announced for African countries in particular to help them cope with uh, climate change um, by adapting and being more resilient, that has also been uh, called as insufficient because, of course, by 2050, African countries may be losing as much as 50 billion euros a year due to climate change related losses essentially and so that is the main issue here the amount of money the amount of commitment coming in from the eu is just not enough to compensate for the losses that countries in africa or elsewhere that are more affected by climate change will be experiencing and how is the eu's fight against climate change developing amid its ongoing energy crisis so we've been just speaking about the funds, uh, essentially, but it's not just the funds. It's also where we're seeing European um, imports, uh, energy imports coming from. So Europe has had to shift from Russian energy exports, so from coal, oil and uh, natural gas to other places in Africa and elsewhere. So it's essentially incentivizing investment in fossil fuels in places in Africa, which is supposed to be turning more towards renewable energies. So we've seen investments of around $5 billion in Senegal to exploit natural gas there. The first LNG tanker left Mozambique for Europe recently. And we've also seen more coal exports leaving South Africa for Europe as a result of um, the energy crisis here in Europe. And that is the main issue that also activists are pointing to. Europe is buying more fossil fuels from other places and essentially by doing so is not helping them uh, being incentivized to shift towards renewables. And as you mentioned, Europe, I also think about Germany, which I'm sure is part of the conversation in Sham El Sheikh. What is the country con committed to at this year's conference? Germany has announced the Climate Shield, which uh, it is taking part in as part of the G7 Group of Nations, which is chairing this year. And it has announced uh, uh, 170 million euros for the Climate Shield. Now, this is supposed to be money that is supposed to help countries in places or places um, in the world where people experience losses due to climate change. So floods, um, storms, and so it's a sort of insurance program. Now, of course, activists say that is just a drop in the ocean. If we look at the losses incurred in the Pakistan floods alone this year, that's billions of dollars. So $160 million just wouldn't go far enough to helping people. That's what activists are saying. So it's just not enough. And there's a lot of criticism there. And of course, even uh, the German foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, asking uh, emerging economies, uh, China, India, or even uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, which which do actually enjoy uh, a lot of benefits from exporting fossil fuels to, you know, put in more funds to help fight climate change. That is not probably the focus here. The focus here is that um, African, that, that Western nations are not doing enough, Germany included. Indeed. Uh, Chiponda, thank you so much for uh, bringing us explainer.
Now, green hydrogen is viewed as vital in the world's shift away from fossil fuels and its production is especially suited to those African countries that are sunnier and less densely populated than other parts of the world. In South Africa, rows of solar panels glinting under the sun are an example of what could be a brighter future for its energy needs. But there are question marks, however, over whether South Africa is ready in terms of its politics and infrastructure to profit from green hydrogen. The proof-of-concept facility in Vredendal, around 150 miles north of Cape Town, is producing green hydrogen, a key element of South Africa's energy transition plan to cut carbon emissions. The Vredendal facility has been developed by Karen Energy in a joint venture. These two electrolyzer sticks, they get the, the, the energy from the, uh, from the sun and then uh, we supply them with pure water and uh, the process of electrolysis takes place in these two um, electrolyzer sticks. And uh, when electrolysis, electrolysis happens here, water is split into hydrogen and oxygen. George Van Rensburg, Karen Energy's executive director, says the proof of concept facility only produces small amounts of green hydrogen, but there are plans to upscale production at nearby Varinstop to produce green hydrogen for local and international markets. The commercial plant in Van Rijnsdorp will use about 10 megawatts of solar power, solar PV power, to power a six to eight megawatt electrolyzer and we will produce roughly about a thousand kilograms of hydrogen per day. According to a plan presented at the UN Climate Summit in Egypt, South Africa could produce over five million tons of green hydrogen by 2040. The plan, catapulting the world's 13th biggest polluter into a greener future, envisages reaching annual production of 10 million tons by 2050 and creating a local market worth $20 billion, employing around 50,000 people. However, it also depends on large-scale and potentially expensive renewable energy infrastructure. According to a Boston consultancy group, South Africa will need to set up six to seven GW of renewable capacity per year for the next two decades, compared with the six GW it has managed in total since 2011. But Managing Director and Energy Analyst at EE Business Intelligence, Chris Yelland, believes the public procurement process for such projects is merged in bureaucracy and legal challenge. We really need to get some policy regulatory and planning certainty which gives investors the confidence to move forward in these very significant kind of projects. Green hydrogen is one of three prongs in South Africa's transition plan. The other two are substituting its aging coal plants with solar and wind power and kick-starting an electric vehicle revolution but for a country still squabbling over when to retire coal plants, it is a mammoth task. Friday last week was Decarbonization Day at the Climate Summit in Sham El Sheikh, Egypt, and it focused on solutions to reduce emissions from carbon-intensive industries such as the steel, oil, and gas sectors. It brought together policymakers, scientists, and industry representatives in an effort to promote collaboration on innovative solutions to reduce carbon emissions. A number of summits, if you've noticed, have been holding across the world in the last few weeks, and they require the movement of people, especially leaders and the delegates from place to place via the airspace and via land, emitting even more carbon into the atmosphere. So who's really checking how much carbon has been emitted so far? As being the expert, Dr. John Osawa is a climate change expert. He joins us from our studio in Abuja. Dr. Osawa, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. I know I've always wanted to know, I mean, with all these conferences holding on, why the amount of carbon emitted by transportation has not been discussed at the conference in Sharm El Sheikh? I, uh, it's good to be here. I guess it's an oversight uh, in the sense that uh, we, we tend to focus on the big issues. Loss and damage, as you know, is dominating the agenda this year. 
Uh, but uh, what I can say, if you look at the, the transport sector, uh, it is by far, uh, it, it has the highest reliance on fossil fuels uh, right. in terms of being able to operate. Uh, uh, so not surprisingly, it is also the sector that contributes the highest amount of greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. Uh, it accounts for about 37% of global greenhouse gas emission. That's very huge. Uh, so we need to cut down on transportation. Uh, you know, that has been the uh, probably one of the uh, good things that came out of the COVID pandemic, if, if you can find any good in that uh, pandemic, is that uh, global mobility decreased, uh, uh, seminars became virtual, uh, instead of live conferences, we're now doing virtual conferences. So that helped to clean up the environment, reduce our carbon emissions uh, by about 5% uh, for 2020. So we need to do more things virtually. We have the capacity to do that. Uh, and I think the world is finding that uh, it's the way to fight climate change at a global level. Yeah, and I think that for a conference holding in Egypt, I mean, even though, you know, most countries have opened up borders, the world it has literally opened up, you know, after COVID-19. I know people are eager, you know, to have these conversations face to face. But do you think leaders really are being sincere, you know, when they hold these meetings and they talk about the action plans to save the world we're living, and then they overlook something just as simple as this? I think, I think uh, global leaders are being sincere. Uh, but but let me also say this, uh, as we've seen uh, in many reports, I don't think that we are putting the amount of financing uh, that is adequate to meet the challenges, the escalating challenges we're seeing. You look at uh, what has happened this year, flooding everywhere in Pakistan and Nigeria here. Uh, we just need to leverage more funding. Uh, and unfortunately, that money, the bulk of that money comes from the developing nations who are a little bit reticent about giving money to Africa because in some cases the money has not been used prudently for the projects funded. Uh, there's, they are, there's also this uh, narrative that the world is getting tired of, this narrative of aid and grant and subsistence for Africa. People want to see Africa step up and begin to do projects that can attract funding because they are bankable not because we go in there cap in hand begging for money. They are not, they are not pointing up the funds. Uh, so we need to uh, do more for ourselves. Uh, everybody is sincere because we understand the science of climate change now. We see it is, is impacts globally, hurricanes in the US, drought in the Horn of Africa, desertification in Nigeria and Niger and the Sahel region. We see flooding in Nigeria, we see flooding in Pakistan heat waves all over the world. So we are seeing the impact, but we need to put more funding. And sometimes that requires a strong political will, uh, which uh, we've seen in the US, it was lacking during the Trump era. In a Bolsonaro era in Brazil, it was lacking. In some other areas, we have climate deniers. So we need to get serious with funding. That's what we need. Uh, that's the gap at this point, because we, we have the science, we have the evidence that climate change is real and is ravaging a lot of economies, but we need to leverage more funding to fight climate change. When we talk about funding, it almost seems like a really broad topic, you know, um, when you're talking about giving African countries um, aid, you know, to, to stem the, the effects of climate change and so on. Exactly what could funding go into in more practical terms? Good. Uh, let me take Nigeria, for instance. We could, we could uh, leverage funding to use our gas as a transition fuel uh, to renewables. The gas that we're flaring now, if we were to harness that gas, we can provide more electricity. Uh, we can uh, do more fertilizer from the gas uh, for our agricultural sector. We can also liquefy the gas and turn it into cooking gas. We can also convert from uh, fossil fuel, from petrol and diesel to gas for our vehicles and transportation sector. So that's the kind of funding that we need to have to move the archaic structures we have into the future. 
Then you look at uh, reforestation and afforestation programs, desert reclamation projects in Nigeria and the Sahel region. Those are very worthy uh, projects that are needed. They can create jobs. They can reduce our carbon because, because of carbon sequestration of the trees. We can reduce our carbon emission. Uh, we can meet our targets, our naturally uh, determined contribution targets better. So there are a number of things we can do in terms of climate change projects in Africa. We can move, uh, do more solar energy projects. We can do mini hydro in some of our rivers, uh, not the large hydro uh, projects we are seeing. Uh, we can do some wind in the Joss uh, region, in the uh, coastlines, by Elsa, rivers, Lagos. We can do some wind energy uh, projects in those regions. So there, there are a number of projects we can do in Africa, in Nigeria, for instance. I wanted to get your thoughts on a protest that took place during this week, and that was um, uh, the vegans, uh, you know, at Sham El Sheikh, who were calling for uh, people to to switch, you know, to vegan-based diets because um, livestock, they say, uh, is breeding more greenhouse gases and equally destroying the environment. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I know that for many meat lovers, this is this is this is a vegan community declaring war on them. Well, uh, I, I, I certainly, uh, I understand. Uh, I understand where they are coming from, but many people in the world, I would say the majority, are not going to go to a vegan diet anytime soon. What we need is sensible consumption. What we need is to avoid the wastage that we see. Uh, in some reports, you will see that as much as 40% of what we are producing is wasted. Uh, Post-harvest loss is very high. Uh, I always say that the amount of food we waste, over 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted. If you were to use that, you could feed the world poor, the hungry, the starving. Everybody will be fed if we were to harness the food that we're wasting. So what we need is better resource management. What we need is common sense utilization of resources. Uh, I don't think I'm going to switch to a vegan <laughs> diet anytime soon. I like my bushmeat, by the way. <laughs> Dr. Sawa, great to know. Great to know. Thank you. Thank you so much for expressing your thoughts and, of course, your analysis on the issues. Thanks for joining us on the program. Thank you. That was a pleasure. Welcome back. And Saudi's crown... Prince Mohammed bin Salman Al Saud has arrived in Bangkok to attend the APEC summit hosted in the Thai capital. Saudi Arabia's de facto ruler's visit comes as relations between Thailand and Saudi Arabia begin to normalize this year. The U.S., however, has determined that Saudi Arabia's de facto leader, the Crown Prince himself, has immunity now from a lawsuit filed by murdered journalist Jamal Khashoggi's fiance. Khashoggi, a prominent Saudi critic, was murdered at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in October 2018. U.S. intelligence has said it believes the prince ordered the killing. But in court filings, the U.S. State Department said he has immunity due to his new role as Saudi Prime Minister. Mr. Khashoggi's ex fiance Hatisa Sengiz, wrote on Twitter, Jamal died again today with the ruling. Prince Mohammed was named Crown Prince by his father, King Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, in 2017. A 37-year-old was then handed the role of Prime Minister in September this year. He denies any role in the killing of Khashoggi. Britain is now in recession, according to Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt. He told MPs on Thursday as he unveiled his plans for more tax rises and spending cuts. In his autumn statement, he said his plan will help rebuild the economy and reduce debt. Our London correspondent, Teniola Oyetayo, has more. I have a bold plan to grow the economy through tax cuts and reform. The reversal of what's been termed the Trossonomics experiment after former Prime Minister Liz Truss's government's underfunded tax cuts sent the pound to an all-time low against the US dollar, threatened chaos in the housing market, and forced Truss to quit after just 50 days in office. <laughs> now new Chancellor Jeremy Hunt in his statement today revealed the government's plan on rebuilding the economy 
This includes a freeze in income tax thresholds, meaning millions of people will pay more in tax as their wages rise. Asking more from those who have more means that the first difficult decision I take on tax is to reduce the threshold at which the 45p rate becomes payable from £150,000 to £125,140. Those earning £150,000 or more will pay just over £1,200 more in tax every year. We are also taking difficult decisions on tax-free allowances. I am maintaining at current levels the income tax personal allowance, higher rate threshold, May national insurance thresholds and the inheritance tax thresholds for a further two years, taking us to April 2028. Mr Hunt also announced an extension of the windfall tax on energy companies' profits and said electric car owners will no longer be exempt from vehicle excise duty from April 2025. Amid forecasts predicting the economy will shrink by 1.4% next year, the Chancellor acknowledged the country is in recession and no things will get worse before they improve. The OBR forecasts the UK's inflation rate to be 9.1% this year and 7.4% next year. They confirm that our actions today help inflation to fall sharply from the middle of next year. They also judge that the UK, like other countries, is now in recession. More support for the vulnerable has been announced and help with energy costs has been extended for all households, but at a less generous level, meaning millions will still face higher bills. I know call. In response, Rachel Reeves, Labour's shadow chancellor, called the government's measures an invoice for the economic carnage. Three prime ministers, four chancellors, and four budgets later. And where do we find ourselves? in a worse place than we started the year. Yeah. Inflation spiralling, growth plunging, living standards falling. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, Britain is a great country with fantastic strengths. Yeah. But because of this government's mistakes, yeah. we are being held back. Yeah. Yeah. What people will be asking themselves at the next election is this. And me and my family better off with a Conservative government and the answer is no. The autumn statement comes as inflation hit a 41-year high on Wednesday at 11.1%, with food rising at an annual rate of 16.5%, intensifying the cost of living crisis. Tenyola Uyetayo for Channel Television News. So in the UK, Manchester United are exploring their legal options as they look to end Cristiano Ronaldo's time at the club. It's accepted at United that Ronaldo cannot play for manager Eric Ten Hag again following his fierce criticism of the Dutchman in his talk TV interview. He's just over seven months remaining on his 500 thousand pound a week contract united could terminate the portuguese forwards contract which would leave him free to sign for another club when the transfer window opens in january it's understood they're loath to offer the 37 year old any kind of payoff given how strongly they feel about the situation club wants the matter dealt with quickly to avoid it spilling over into the second half of the season during his interview we remember ronaldo said he felt betrayed by the club and says that he had no respect for ten hag adding he felt he was being forced out of the club. United responded on Friday with a statement saying they have initiated appropriate steps in response. Ronaldo will captain Portugal at the World Cup in Qatar with their opening group H game against Ghana on Thursday. He's not played because of an unspecified illness since he captained United in their 3-1 defeat at Aston Villa on November 6. Our sports correspondent, Austin Okonakwan, is in London from where he has a bird's eye view of everything. Austin, great to see you. It's been a while we have had you here. And I know you, you watched the interview uh, with uh, Ronaldo had with Piers Morgan. How do you think fans are taking it? I mean, I know your opinion, but how do you think fans are reacting to this? It's part of criticism of Marachi. It's good to, good to be on the show. So it, it, it's divided opinions. You'd expect a sort of reaction from, from fans. Manchester United followers uh, of the opinion of Cristiano Ronaldo disrespected the club. The lovers of Cristiano Ronaldo are saying that after all, he's human, human that he's feeling some sort of hurt and needed to speak his mind. 
I think to a larger extent, that's what a lot of press presses feel about Cristiano Ronaldo outburst. You know, Match United, if, if you see the, their press statement that was released, was released hey, they only said they have, they have initiated steps, steps towards uh, address Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo comments and they said they will not be saying anything uh, until they come to the conclusion. It means, means they also are, look, are looking at that, look, this guy probably has his reasons. Yes, it brought the name of the club to disrepute. But this is Cristiano Ronaldo Amarachi. At 37, he has achieved basically everything, anything a pro footballer would want to achieve in their career. Is will not be taken out of his because of this statement. But yeah, it's pretty professional. He said the things he said, and he will face the leak. Yeah, and for some people, they feel that you know they really got to know him better through this interview. They feel that they they could see his heart. You know, that he's just a human being after all. But then he has offended the club, hasn't he? What is in the future for him now? He goes on to Qatar, and then what? And I tell you, clubs in Qatar are approaching him. They will be saying, look. We'll give you a million uh, pounds a week. He currently earns five hundred thousand pounds a week at third one where, where he's been there, done that play, play for Manchester United. If coming to Manu, he was at Sporting Lisbon and they went to Real Madrid, Madrid and he went UV skin record cuts still came back. Don't forget in that interview, you Cristiano Ronaldo told, told us he wanted to Man City. In fact, that was initiated. But Sir Alex, Alex Ferguson, who is very instrumental in his history as a footballer, convinced him to go back to Manchester United. We don't underground agreement that is making Cristiano Ronaldo fat of his heart. He, he feels he's disrespected. And I, I said it when they were saying Cristiano Ronaldo. I said Ten Hag should be ready to deal with his, with his ego. That's a big, big time player you're bringing to the team. So, so if tell him you're going, going to play him 8% of the time, you should keep to the agreement. Remember, good to know no more. Manchester United, United you force that league to go out and Cristiano leaves the club. But if you ask me where he's going, he's going yeah. clubs, clubs are really lining up. This is Cristiano Ronaldo. He used to play football. Yeah, and I'm sure that there are diehard fans who will follow Cristiano anywhere he goes in the world. Thanks again, Austin. Was it was a delight. Thank you, Chamarachi. Finally on the program, a Nigerian designer is pushing for environmental protection through eco-friendly fashion uh, with his fashion line, Azak. He uses uh, discarded clothing items to produce casual streetwear. Let's take a look. Uchi Aladima sorts through a row of jackets looking for a piece from his latest collection. A short sleeve patchwork shirt made from different shades of denim cutoffs. With a cream-colored canvas serving as a backdrop, he takes pictures of his two models and uploads them to his website. The 28-year-old sustainable fashion enthusiast launched his eco-friendly brand, Azak, in February 2022 to fight against fast fashion in Africa's most populous nation by using second-hand clothes to produce durable streetwear popular with young adults. The engineering graduate said his love for upcycle started from his university school days when he could never bring himself to throw away an outgrown cloth but would rather take it to a tailor to add or remove a part. I would go back to school, wear this clothes to class, and my friends would be asking me, where did you get, where did you get this stuff from? I'll be, uh, so I'll tell them, okay, I'm the one that did it. They'll be like, oh, wow, nice. Come and do for me now. Fun, I'll come and me do now. I will pay you. And that was how I started. I did for one person, did for two people, you know, word of mouth, and that was how people were coming. <laughs> Aladima starts by going to the open market in Lagos to sort through about to be discarded denim wear popularly known as Agenda, which vendors are mostly unable to sell. They sometimes end up in landfills. Some of all these fabric, you don't sell them, people don't buy them. So they bring it out for me, I'll select the one and I'll work it. So these are the some of the ones I like. So I'll take this back to the studio and you know blend them and upcycle them. He gets to his shop and decides whether to turn them into a shirt, a skirt, an apron, or even a tote bag. But before the clothes hit his website, they go through various processes of washing, sterilization, and ironing. So all the material we work with are materials that I can use for a long time. So when you buy them, you don't have to throw them away. They are clothes you can pass down to people. Even you can still upcycle them again. So that's how we are fighting. That's our own uh, way of fighting this fast fashion, producing clothes that are durable and long-lasting. Okay. Aladima sells only online for now. 
for as low as 10 US dollars depending on the item. He worked mainly with fabrics like denim, leather, khaki and corduroy because of their durability. In the future, he hopes to make furniture using denim. And that's the world today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.